We are in week three of our series on interrupting Jesus. And if you remember the premise, originally I said I was intrigued by the notion of times that Jesus gets interrupted because when we get interrupted, we tend to respond spontaneously. And oftentimes our spontaneous responses are not our best. Um, we haven't gathered ourselves. We're responding out of our own fear or frustration or something like that. And so we're much more likely to respond curtly or unkindly if, uh, if we're surprised, and interruptions often come as a surprise. Uh, as you look at Jesus, you realize it's almost the exact opposite. Every time he's interrupted, he responds in a way that runs to the very depth of who he is, and, uh, and he ends up revealing something about himself that we might not have known. And so it was when he is interrupted at Levi's house and people say, how come he's eating with sinners? That he says, these are the very people that I've come for. So in a series on interrupting Jesus, you have to do Mark chapter 5, the story of uh, the woman with the issue of blood. It's a classic interruption story. In fact, Mark constructs the story as a story within a story. The very basis of the story is that Jesus is interrupted. And in this case, the interruption proves fatal. So let me set the scene for you. Uh, Jesus has gone into a deep region. He has confronted the Gerasene demoniac, uh, as he is known in the beginning of Mark chapter 5. Uh, he is a demon-possessed man who's living on the outskirts of society. Jesus completely transforms his life and frees him from all the demonic influence and changes the man's life. He gets in a boat, comes back over, and lands, and as he lands, a crowd starts to gather. So we're still in this phase where crowds are gathering around Jesus every time he responds. So um, as he's traveling along um, by the lake, it says in Mark chapter 5, verse 21, uh, when Jesus had again crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came to him. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly for him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Jairus was a man of some standing. It says he is a synagogue ruler, meaning he was a layperson, um, he, but he was in charge of everything that happened at the synagogue. He wasn't a worship leader, and he wasn't a rabbi, but he ran everything. He set the agenda. He got the people. Um, he oversaw all the administration and the finances. It was a position of some authority. And so most religious authorities... Um, are very suspicious of Jesus, and they are giving Jesus a hard time. It was the religious authorities that criticized him when he went to Levi's house. Um, and so this is a man who is part of that establishment, though not directly. And, um, but he is ready to humble himself before Jesus, and in particular because he's scared. He's really scared. His daughter um, is, is dying. Literally, it says she is She's at death's door. She's in the process of dying. And, um, you know, please come and put your hands on her so that she will live. This man seems to have no doubt that if Jesus can get there, uh, his daughter will be healed. And he's ready to humble himself, regardless of what other people might think, uh, if that will save his daughter. Uh, not hard to enter into the emotions of a man who has a child who's, who's very, very sick. He's scared. And so Jesus, without any further comment or without any criticism of what these people have meant to him or anything like that, he just says, I'll go. And he starts off. Now, remember, there's a crowd of people around Jesus uh, when this happens. And Jairus is a well-known man. So when all this happens, Jesus starts off to, uh, to meet this girl and the crowd follows. So you have to picture Jesus surrounded by a crowd, a mob of people, walking down the narrow streets through the village to Jairus' house. Everybody's jostling Jesus. Everybody's pushing him. And, and everybody wants to see what's going to happen. They suspect that something great's going to happen. And here's their opportunity to maybe even see a miracle. 
So it says the large crowd followed and pressed around him. This is where we meet the second person. This is where the interruption happens. Mark records it like this. And when a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of growing better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. A little background on this woman. She is not named. The synagogue ruler gives us his name. It's Jairus. This woman is not named. Uh, she is the opposite of Jairus. She is a woman who has been subject to bleeding um, for 12 years. Most people think this is in some way bleeding from the, bleeding from the womb, uh, particularly involved with being a woman. And the bleeding just never stops. And she can't seem to get healthy. The, um, it says that she suffered a great deal under many doctors. She spent all she had. So many doctors, much suffering, real anguish. And yet she spent all she had and had nothing to show for it. There was no healing. There was no relief. Compounding this, Leviticus, um, Leviticus 25 tells us pretty clearly that uh, when a woman has an issue of blood, as women do monthly, they are ceremonially unclean. So they cannot go to the temple um, and they can't be around anybody else while they're ceremonially unclean. And anything they touch is ceremonially unclean. Any body they touch is ceremonially unclean. And there's actually a procedure that a woman has to go through each month in order to be rendered clean to be able to participate in worship. Um, and it specifically says in Leviticus that if by some chance uh, a woman's cycle goes longer than seven days and she continues to bleed, that she continues to be unclean for as long as that happens. Now, there are some things that are in Leviticus that passed out of use by the time of Jesus. Rarely did anybody get stoned for an offense, that kind of thing. But this is not one of them. Uh, evidence shows that this was something that was intensified in a very patriarchal culture. These guidelines around women were even strengthened. So here's a woman, so for 12 years, anytime she touched somebody, that person was ritually unclean. She could never participate in worship services. She could never go to a synagogue. She could never go to the temple. She could never participate. Uh, she could never have intimacy with somebody without that person becoming ceremonially unclean for a dozen years. Um, the, the, the word that's used in the original language denotes anguish, just ongoing suffering and just tremendous frustration. Her frustration was such that she had determined she was going to push through the crowd and she was not going to ask Jesus. She was not going to confront Jesus. She was just going to touch the, the hem of his garment. This word is probably the, the, the talluses, that, that, that the fringes that uh, are at the end of a Jewish prayer cloak. Uh, any devout Jew would have been wearing a prayer cloak, which they would have put over their head when they prayed. It would have been around Jesus' shoulder. And she just goes up and is, and is going to grab the, the, the tassels, the tassels of, of Jesus' garment. And um, so she pushes through. Now remember, everybody who she touches in that crowd is ceremonially unclean. If they had known who she was, she would have been excluded from the crowd. She risks that. She risks being seen. She risks that when she touches Jesus, he, the great rabbi, will become ceremonially unclean. But she's so desperate, she reaches through, she touches his tassels, and she is healed. She's healed immediately. She knows just deep inside her being that, that she's better, that she's completely whole. Sometimes that happens when we're very, very sick. We wake up one morning and we realize, I'm better. I, I'm, it's over. The fever is broken. I'm strong again. This woman knew immediately in her body that she was healed. Then the interesting things happen. 
Verse 30 says, At once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? Only Mark uses this phrase, that power had gone out of Jesus. We can only imagine Jesus senses immediately that someone has touched him in faith, and that person has been healed. Now remember, everybody's jostling Jesus. He's in the middle of a crowd. And he stops and he says, Who's touched my clothes? And the disciples, of course, respond with, Jesus, what are you crazy? Everybody's touched your clothes. Everybody can get close to you. Um, you can see people, um, how can you ask who touched me? But Jesus says in verse 32, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told the whole truth. Picture this. We know how ostracized this woman has been. We know what she's risked in going to Jesus. We know that she is somebody who's been excluded from everybody else. They can't deal with her anymore. She's unhealthy. And, and now she's been healed, but Jesus has stopped the entire crowd and has said, who is it? Who is it? And she realizes, I've been found out. And so she comes. You can only imagine the amount of fear she must have had coming to Jesus. And she comes to him and she tells him the whole truth. I've been, I've been sick. I've been bleeding. No one can help me. I've spent all my money on doctors. I don't have any money. I don't have any hope. I don't have any fellowship. I don't have any friends. And, and I, I just thought maybe if I touched you, it would heal me. And Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Rather than addressing her with anger or with judgment or everything that she could have expected, Jesus responds in great compassion, with great tenderness. Daughter, he says. And, and, and you realize that the reason that Jesus has stopped the crowd is because this woman has been healed, but she thinks the healing is kind of the result of almost a magic moment that somehow she's tricked Jesus into healing her, that he's, he's, a, he's a, a wizard of some sort. His clothes are magic, and that something magical has happened to her by touching him, and he wants her to realize it's not like that. You've been healed because of your faith. You've been healed because God has seen your suffering. God saw your faith, and God has chosen to heal you through me. And it's God's desire to make you whole based on your faith that has healed you. It's not because you tricked anybody. It's not because you stole anything from anybody. Um, you are whole. And perhaps Jesus wanted everybody there to know that she was now healed. So she was, she's completely vindicated in front of this whole crowd. So it's a wonderful story. She interrupts Jesus. He responds with compassion. He sees her, this outcast, and he heals her. It's a great story. The only problem is, is that he has stopped his forward progress to Jairus' house. And in the time that Jesus has been looking for this woman and dealing with her, some people come from Jairus' house and they say, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter, he said, is dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? So you can imagine, Jesus has stopped to heal this woman. That's all well and good. But now his daughter has died and, and all hope is lost. This is, this is the person who expires in the ambulance on the way to the emergency room. By the time they pull up into the, to the parking lot, they say, she's gone. She's gone. You're, imagine a, a parent following uh, an ambulance and pulling up behind the ambulance as it gets into the hospital, running into the hospital only to find out she didn't make it to the hospital. That's what this man is feeling. And his friend's saying, it, it, it's, it's over, it's over. But into that moment, Jesus overhears them and he says to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. That, that took a lot of faith. Um, what would he have to believe? What, what was there to believe? And that leads to the last part of the story. Jesus did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. 
they came to the home of the synagogue leader and they saw the commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they all laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and he said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and she began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished and he gave strict orders to let, um, he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So Jesus says to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. And he had to believe, which for him meant allowing Jesus to continue to his house. Jesus walks in with Peter, James, and John, and he rebukes the people who are there mourning. These were probably professional mourners. Um, it was the job of a bereaved person to hire professional mourners to chant over the body, to, uh, to express mourning for everybody. It's, it was, um, uh, there was nothing, nothing morbid about it. It was like contacting a uh, funeral home. It's what you did. Um, but they responded the way anybody would have gone into a funeral home and said, you know, why are you all dressed in dark colors? She's not dead. Um, but Jesus raised her. Now, in these two characters, Jairus and the woman, are different in almost every way. One is an outcast, one is respectable, one is probably wealthy, one has spent all of her money. But they're both facing death, and they're both desperate. Um, and in both of them, Jesus sees and Jesus responds. In both of them, Jesus responds. The fact that he blesses one person does not mean that he can't bless somebody else. The fact that he's met one need doesn't mean that there's not enough of him to go around to meet another need. Um, and, and what we learn from this is that the only thing they have in common is that they're desperate enough to come to Jesus with their fears. They're desperate enough to come to Jesus with their brokenness and with their hurt. And that makes them more alike than anybody else in the story. And so that's what we see. When, when our issues, when our brokenness, when our hurt makes us so desperate that we go to Jesus with no agenda, then he brings life out of death, hope out of despair, um, healing out of brokenness. He meets all the needs. But notice that he's not only just meeting needs, he wants to make sure that we know that it's him. He pulls us aside and says, this is by faith. This is not a magic trick. I want all of this to lead to relationship with me. So the question for us as, as we close is, you know, what is your desperate cry to God? Uh, what is your big fear? What is your big concern? And are you willing to bring that concern to Jesus for him to meet in however he wants to do it? Mm -hmm.